Okay, today I'm at the Erksley Formation, and um, this formation lies just below the Bulleye Coal Measures, um, and the top of the Bulleye Coal Measures marks the end of the uh, Permian period and uh, the Permian Triassic Extinction Event Boundary. And I just want to show you, in amongst um, this fluvial deltic setting, is uh, some discarded uh, or washed down. Uh, large glossopterous trees and I just want to show you one of these trees um, that I found um, embedded within uh, the rock matrix. So this is one of the uh, glossopterous um, pre-mineralized um, fossils and as you can see it's quite large compared to compared to my hand and um, uh, it's speculated that uh, the glossopterous tree actually um, could grow to about 16 meters um, high and you can see by the size of this uh, particular particular tree trunk that um, it possibly could have been um, could have definitely been quite a large tree and if I push in a little closer you can see that this tree is also um, quite old um, although the rings are not uh, well represented you can still see that there are uh, quite a lot of uh, rings which uh, represent um, seasonal growth, uh, it's, uh, winter and summer. Um, so yeah, this is just uh, just one of the uh, Glossopteris uh, pre-mineralized uh, trees that you can see within the Erksley Formation. There's a few of them, this is probably one of the best examples of one that I've seen. And I'll just give you a little bit of a, little bit of a look at that. So it is believed that these Glossopterus trees actually grew to about 16 meters high. And this example here is probably one of the best examples of where we can see the actual length of the, the trunk itself. And if I, I'll just pick up the camera and I'll take you along and we can see where the, the trunk has been exposed further along. And you can actually get an, ex get an idea of how large these uh, Glossopterus trees were. If I follow it along, we can see that it is exposed again. If I can just get out of the way of the sun, you can see that the trunk runs all the way, all the way along, and it's actually quite large. Uh, continues further on uh, through the formation. So there, there is an example of uh, the length that uh, these Glossopteris trees could actually get. That would have been quite a quite a tall tree when it was uh, when it was living, and um, it's been deposited amazingly, or uh, well washed down. Uh, one of the delta channels and uh, embedded within the within the matrix uh, within the formation uh, in its entirety and that's uh, very impressive to see you don't see many examples of Glossopteris in uh, pretty much its uh, relative in entire length Here we can see where a branch would have uh, protruded from the from the trunk itself. Uh, we can see where the where the branch uh, was embedded within the uh, or grew out of the trunk. We can almost see see some of the uh, original bark that was um, was on the uh, was on the Glossopteris. So this is a wider view of the Erksley Formation. We can see the various uh, coarser sandstone sedimentary layers on top of uh, some of the finer uh, mudstones. And um, this was part of a, a fluvial uh, or delta setting. And um, I want to show you another example of a large Glossopteris 
tree trunk uh, that has been eroded from the formation. So this is a, another example of a large Glossopteris and um, we can see that it still remains uh, embedded within the, the mudstone, the clay mudstone that um, it was probably embedded in when it was washed down. And to have a closer look, we'll see if we can see any rings, uh, not on this side, don't see don't see many examples. I'll, I'll go over to the other side. Okay, on this side we see a few examples of the, the telltale uh, Glossopteris rings and um, we can see that the, the growth was quite, quite small uh, between the, the, the summer and the, um, the winter m um, months. Uh, so this tree, judging off the, the thickness of these rings, um, would be quite a large tree. Um, probably, I you guess, know, estimating could have been anywhere between 50 and 100 years old or even older. Uh, growing in a cool climate, um, I'm not sure how old these trees actually got. So again, um, another example of a uh, large Glossopteris tree trunk in the... Uh, we could see via the, this kind of layer that uh, the, the water velocity would have changed, uh, would, have, would have been um, with the smaller granules uh, flowing uh, not as fast as when um, some of these larger, larger granules were uh, transported. So if I just move up, I'll show you another example of some carbonated plant material that can be seen within this formation. Um, there's an example of a, of probably a branch or even possibly this may be an example of a um, Glossopteris root. So this is the last example of a um, Glossopteris trunk that I want to show you. And again we can see that uh, it is uh, embedded within the um, formation. Um, it's around. It's got uh, fairly fine to medium coarse um, granuled uh, sort of sandstone, and in amongst that we can see uh, various carbonaceous layers. So this indicates that uh, when this was deposited, that the um, outflow of water through the delta um, was carrying various. Um, plant material um, which was deposited um, as the waters probably uh, reduced. These, these may even indicate uh, winter thaws and um, the larger volume of water um, being released, washing down uh, some of these Glossopteris trunks um, in the process. I thought I'd found all of the sort of more impressive Glossopteris uh, branches and trunks but I actually found one more in this large boulder and I'll just see if I can get in there and show you. So here we've got another example of a Glossopteris trunk or even a Glossopteris branch um, embedded within, within the um, formation, um, within the fluvial formation. And I'm sure if you took a nice, um, sort of a nice cut of that, you'd probably see some great growth rings in there. But uh, nevertheless, another nice example of a Glossopteris trunk. So what I want to do now is take you just around a little bit uh, further north along the formation um, and show you some examples of some Glossopteris roots or uh, vertebra uh, that can be found within a finer uh, bleached sandstone and um, I should be able to find you some good examples of these uh, vertebra Glossopteris roots. This is the area I wanted to show you and a lot of this uh, rockfall has come from further up uh, it's on some of the uh, Erksley Formation cliff faces. Uh, I'll show you probably a better example of that. But anyway, 
down the bottom here, we can see some examples of some Glossopteris uh, vertebrate. I'll just see if I can find a few. They're pretty easy to spot because they're uh, pretty much everywhere. So here is a sort of cross-section, um, a good example of uh, one of these uh, Glossopteris roots. So moving around a little further, I'm just trying to find you some, uh, some good examples. Here we can um, see some side-on examples of uh, some of the roots. Okay, this appears to offer a pretty good example. Uh, what we see here, these little star uh, kind of uh, fossils are the roots themselves, and these and these are telltale Glossopteris roots. Uh, you can tell that by by this uh, this kind of pattern uh, that they have. So again, we can see that typical Glossopteris. Uh, vertebra root pattern, and um, that's evident uh, throughout a lot of uh, a lot of this fine grain uh, sandstone. So this area at this time, when uh, these roots uh, were in amongst this uh, soft, uh, silty, sandy mud, would have uh, it would have been the bottom of a peat um, a peat uh, mire, and uh, these peat mires extended for 100 kilometres and lasted for. Um, 160,000 odd years or so. So here's another example of uh, more of these roots. You can see the, the star, the star pattern. Um, this is uh, looking down, uh, down through the root or up through the root. Uh, we see this uh, this typical this typical pattern. Okay, I'll just show you a few more examples. Here we've got some smaller roots. So this is uh, the root of the Glossopteris um, 249 million years ago. Uh, this was a geniosperm or a seed uh, tree, seed plant, and um, they lived in the cool climate swamps um, the end of the Permian and uh, before that period of time and were wiped out at the Permian-Triassic extinction event. And, uh, there we go.